However, there's one person who volunteers and is very successful at volunteering, and that person is, of course, Lafayette. Now, I consider Lafayette to be what I call a singular sensation because Lafayette was a unique example in France. Most, most of the French volunteers did not have the glorious success of Lafayette. Many of them would go to America, present themselves, parler un peu de français, um, and then be turned down because they cannot speak English and they would get very grumpy and go back to France and feel very, very upset that they were not accepted into the American army. But Lafayette is different. And Lafayette is unique. He, start, he starts off as a very unique individual because as, for one, uh, he is a young man. He is only 19 years old when he, when he leaves for America. His father died when he was two. So that means that Lafayette does not have a chaperone, he, and he is independently wealthy. So he doesn't have to ask his father for money to hire a ship and go to America. He can just do what he wants. And so Lafayette, um, as, as a young man growing up, his father was dead, so he became the ward um, of the Comte de Noël, uh, uh, and eventually married the Comte de Noël's daughter, Adrienne. Uh, he and Adrienne were very happily married. Um, she had a little girl named Henriette. Um, and then when she was pregnant again, Lafayette heard, heard tell of this wonderful opportunity that he might have to go to America. And so because he was independently wealthy, um, he was able to hire his own ship. He hopped on a ship with about 12 officers and uh, the Baron de Cub and uh, 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 the Duc de Broy. And he started to sail towards America. And he was very excited about this, except he forgot to tell his wife that he was leaving. <laughs> So when, he's on his so when he's on the ship, and his ship is called La Victoire, Victory, uh, he writes a letter to his wife and says, Dear Adrian, and I will paraphrase a little bit here, I'm very sorry I didn't say goodbye before I left for America, but just so you know, I've left for America. She and her family, of course, have already heard about this through the grapevine. Other people have, to have told her where he is. And he says, I hope that you can forgive me. He says, but I have to go to America because it is the most wonderful land of liberty, and we really need to support these Americans. And I hope, Adrienne, that you will become a good American and that you will support liberty and that you will support freedom and, and that you will understand why I have to go. And it's a beautiful letter. Um, in fact, you can read the letter in this lovely book. You'll find the bibliographic information for it underneath my YouTube video. But it's a book about Lafayette that is very clearly written. It's very good for a non-academic reader. It has wonderful stories about Lafayette in here that I won't have time to cover. But, but Lafayette crosses the water. He, he writes his wife this wonderful letter expressing his incredible joy of getting to go to America and fight. And again, in, in these feelings, Lafayette is unique because while there's lots of support for the American Revolution, um, <clears throat> some of it's very ideological, like this wonderful woman with the boat on her head, and some of it uh, is, is more diplomatic and a little bit more politically shrewd. But, but Lafayette is just full of sincere joy and sincere respect for this American Revolution. So Lafayette sells the ocean blue. He lands in Charleston in 1777 in the summer. And he is determined that he is going to love America. So, of course, he loves it, even though he gets to march from Charleston up to Philadelphia in the month of July, which, as we all know, is not going to. And, of course, they did not have air conditioning. Of course, he's wearing a heavy coat, um, which is, could not have been the most pleasant time of year to make that march. But he's determined to love America and love it he does. And he's so excited and he cannot wait to present himself. And he's been promised a commission in the army, in the American army, as a major general, which is normal for a 19-year-old man who's well off in France. So he has no reason to think that might not happen. And he is marching north, and he is so excited. He gets to Philadelphia on July 27th of 1777, and he knocks on the door of Congress and says, here I am. And the man who opens the door says, thank you. We do not need your services. Please go away, and closes the door in his face. And Lafayette is very shocked and a little distressed. And he explains, no, you don't understand. I, I have a letter of introduction. I have come all this way to help you in your revolution. I am a French officer. I know something about war. I, I am willing to fight and die for you. You know, please accept me into the army. And he again gets the answer. There are many French officers who have come and offered their services. Um, your English is pretty bad. We really don't need you. Goodbye. And Lafayette's kind of taken aback by this. This is not at all the welcome he expected. Fortunately for Lafayette, he's, he's a Mason. And we all remember that Masons uh, was, was, a, was a secretive group of individuals. George Washington was one, and that they had special connections between them. So Lafayette is, is a Mason, and he writes a note to, to John Hancock, who is also a Mason and president of Congress. And he says, dear Mason brother, uh, I came here to fight for you. Please accept me into the army. And he uses the little Mason code, which looks kind of like three little points of a triangle. And so John Hancock is willing to entertain Lafayette. And he says, OK, we'll work out a deal. And that Lafayette's deal to be in the American Army is essentially he will get no pay, 
He will provide for all of his own expenses, so he will buy his own horse, he will provide his own uniform, he'll provide his own weapons, he'll buy everything himself, he'll provide his own food. He can be a major general, but that is going to be a symbolic rank only. You will not actually have any authority whatsoever. And Lafayette says, okay. Uh, and, and you will essentially do whatever it is we tell you to do. And if it's stand in the corner and don't do anything, you will stand in a corner and not do anything. And Lafayette says, this sounds great. And he is, eagerly goes off to join George Washington. Um, and, and the con Congress knows that Lafayette is a very influential man, that he comes, comes from a very important family in France, that he's very wealthy, and that he has, um, he has, very, he has very good French heritage. His, his father died when he was too fighting for, for, for the king. And so they, this is an opportunity for America to kind of woo the French and, and to provide official aid for them. And Lafayette, um, is, if, if Lafayette does well, and they kind of say, you know, let Lafayette have, see some action, but don't let him get killed mm -hmm. because we, want, we, we would like for, for France to officially commit to the American cause. And so Lafayette shows up to see George Washington, and George Washington is rather cranky because he's had to go through many French officers with great expectations and has had to turn most of them down. And Lafayette shows up and says, here I am, George Washington. And George Washington is, is not very thrilled. And then Lafayette explains, but, but, but you see, I am here to learn. I am not here to tell you what to do. I am here to learn. And with that, with that phrase, uh, Lafayette and George Washington start to become very good friends. And because George Washington is such a mythic person in our history, we have lots of wonderful myths about George Washington that are not true. And because Lafayette is such an important person in our national history, we have lots of myths about Lafayette which are not necessarily true. But the very close relationship between Lafayette and Washington is very true. And they both, they both had some similarities, both lost their fathers at young ages. Um, both men had, a, had, a very, had an interest in military affairs. Um, for, for Lafayette, Washington was kind of like the father he never had, and, and, and Washington did not have any of his own children. So Lafayette was kind of like the, the son he never had. Washington had um, raised two children with Martha that Martha had brought to the marriage with her, but he didn't have any of his own. So he, he and Lafayette formed a very close bond. And it wasn't until too long after Lafayette started to work with General Washington that he started to ask for responsibility and started to ask to command troops. And at first, Washington was rather hesitant because you're supposed to let him see a little bit of action, but he can't get killed. And Washington has no idea how skilled Lafayette is as a commander. But at the Battle of Brandywine, the Americans are losing against the British. And in fact, the American general um, who's, in, who's in charge of a certain group of troops um, is a lawyer and has no experience in the military whatsoever and doesn't really know what to do. And the, and the American troops, they've broken their line. Remember, lines, standing in lines and firing at the same time is very important. But they've broken their line. They're, they're retreating in great disorder. And so Lafayette says, okay, or Washington says, okay, Lafayette, you can, you can go help the Americans who are in pell-mell. Um, and they're already losing against the British at, at Brandywine. So Lafayette goes, and Lafayette's a very tall man. He's about six foot one. He's sitting on his horse. He goes riding in to go help the Americans, and he rides up and down in between the, the disorganized American troops and the advancing British, which is a great place to get shot and killed. And so it shows a lot of bravery for Lafayette, and he gets a good amount of respect for being willing to just ride up and down with his horse, yelling at the, yelling at the American troops and trying to rally them. But that does not work, and the Americans are actually turning around and running away. So Lafayette jumps off of his horse, and he actually will run after people, grab them by the shoulders, turn them around, and say, no, face that direction, face towards the British. Um, and that doesn't really work either as far as, as getting the Americans to, to fight back, but he is able to gather them, he is able to rally them, and get the, give them an orderly retreat so they're not just running all over the place and being picked off. During this action, um, Lafayette gets shot in the leg, and Lafayette is thrilled, <laughs> uh, which might seem odd. But Lafayette, and it might seem odd that Lafayette is able to claim that he led a good retreat. But in European warfare of the 18th century, leading a good retreat so that you don't lose your army in a bunch of chaos, but that you're able to get your army together, make a graceful exit from a scene which you cannot win, and keep your army whole is incredibly important, and especially as Washington's army is very small and he needs every single person he can get. And these are not very well-trained troops. These, these, these are people who have just joined the army and are not used to this kind of discipline. So it says a lot for Lafayette that he was able to gather them and, and help them retreat. Now, for his wound, Lafayette is thrilled because it's not a serious wound. It's a flesh wound. It's going to heal and he's not going to die of gangrene. But he shed blood for the liberty of America. And this is very exciting. And maybe it even sounds a little sentimental. But in the French army, being wounded was very important. Because remember, the French officers are very eager to fight so that they can prove to the king that, look, I am a good fighter, and, and I can defend the patrie, and I can fight for the king. And if they shed blood for the king, it usually means they're going to get some kind of a pension or promotion or decoration. Because if you shed blood for the king, it really shows how you have sacrificed yourself 
for the king. And sometimes it's not so important whether or not you win the battle, but if you get wounded trying really hard to win the battle will count for a lot in the French army. And so in this case, you have Lafayette who's been wounded and he's able to write home and say, I have seen battle. I was able to organize the Americans and lead them into an orderly retreat, and I got wounded doing it. I have shed blood for George Washington. It's a great day for Lafayette. And of course, he's going to heal and be fine, so it gives him plenty of reasons to be happy. And he does heal, and, and he is fine. But he impresses, but with this, this action, Lafayette impresses the American army, and people are happy to give him a uh, 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 charge of more men. And at some point, he, he, he stops working, he stops being right at George Washington's elbow, and he starts actually taking his own men out and, and performing bravely in, uh, in the American Revolution. And it also does wonderful things for France, because when Lafayette left, left France to fight in America, he caused all kinds of problems, and not just for his pregnant wife with a baby. Um, he caused all kinds of problems for his father-in-law, who was supposed to have some kind of charge of Lafayette, and who clearly had, had lost control of him, and he caused huge, huge problems for Louis XVI, the king of France. Because remember, France is not supposed to join the American Revolution. France is staying back. It's kind of watching. It currently officially has peace with England. And even though the French government is finding ways to send little pieces of help in the American direction, officially they're not, they're not involved. And so the fact that you have a very high-ranking French noble from a very important family who's extremely visible going to America to fight makes it look like Louis XVI isn't serious about maintaining peace with Britain. And as interested as the, as the French are in American, America winning the American Revolution, remember that they don't want to join a war they don't know they're going to win. And at this point, the French are very unsure if the Americans are going to win this war, so they don't want to get involved. And so when Lafayette went to America, he really created a diplomatic problem. Um, and, and, and the French officials had to explain to the British, look, look, we're very sorry about this one noble. It's just one guy. It doesn't mean that we're going to join the Americans at all. No, no, really, we're still at peace. But when Lafayette performs bravely in battle and he gets, and he, and he gets wounded to boot, um, people in France go crazy. Now, instead of being uh, uh, an outcast and in, instead of being decried uh, for his actions, Lafayette is thinking, oh, Laf Lafayette is praised. Oh, this is, this is, this is good. Look, look how well the, our French officer is performing in North America. This is wonderful. And of course, all this patriotic, idealistic view of America it gets, gets, gets um, exaggerated even more. And even more French volunteers are interested in going to America now because they can fight bravely and they, they, can, they can show their zeal. Um, uh, uh, for service.